Hi. Uh, so yes, uh, this talk is about rethinking web accessibility. Generally speaking, when you have uh, a web accessibility talk, you, you generally have a person telling you, OK, how to make your site more accessible. Um, but this talk is you know, the flip side of it. It's about how to make the physical world a little bit more accessible using the web. So let's get started. A little bit about me, uh, I work at a company called Barrier Break. I am head of accessibility, innovation, and research over there. I just recently um, also became uh, one of the co-editors for the HTML uh, spec in the W3C. I'm also a member of a few other W3C groups, like the AG Working Group, which is working on the next version of the WCAG guidelines. And previously, as Matthias said, uh, we used to be colleagues uh, at Opera. Right now, um, I'm working at a company called Barrier Break, which is based in Mumbai. Uh, and it does a lot of work with um, you know, web accessibility, everything, consulting, auditing, and all that kind of stuff. But it's, a, it's an organization with a social mission. And one of, one of the things that we, we do is to make sure that we provide a lot of opportunity to people with disabilities, so much so that, um, generally speaking, about 70% of our employees are people with disabilities, some form of disability, so w which I think is pretty cool. And basically unheard of in a tech company. Um, one, of the, uh, one of my colleagues and friends over there is a person named Amit. Um, he was born with low vision. And back in 2005, he met with an accident in a chemistry lab, uh, which rendered one of his eyes, his right eye, uh, he couldn't see from his eye anymore. Um, um, but that didn't really stop him. Uh, in fact, uh, that gave him even more resolve. Right now, he's a trainer at Barrier Break, and he, and he is doing a lo great job over there working uh, and uh, training various organizations and developers on how to make their sites accessible. But one of the things that I noticed about him was that when he was, when basically he uh, uses uh, a magnifier, like a screen magnifier, um, he basically uses the phone's camera and tries to magnify that as much as possible. And since he has extreme low vision, he actually puts it right up to his face, right, like this, almost. Um, so I, when I was noticing that, I was like, hmm, can I do something about that? Um, fortunately, we also have a lot of other low vision people uh, in Barrier Break, so I talked to them, uh, internal employees. I also talked with a few friends of mine who were low vision and tried to get a, you know, a sense of an idea of, okay, what are the, you know, um, what are the common problems that they face in day-to-day -day life? What are the annoyances? Uh, I also talked to uh, a few of the family members uh, of people with uh, low vision issues. And I even went to an ophthalmologist. Um, I, I had nothing wrong with my eyes, but I just had a consultation with them, uh, trying to get a medical perspective on this, and also a perspective of, uh, of, of a person who has dealt with um, you know, hundreds of patients with low vision issues. And we discussed a little bit of the literature around it and a lot of the low vision issues around it. Fun fact, um, they said that since I've come over here, uh, you cannot leave without having an eye exam. So I got my eyes checked. Um, but uh, yeah, what I found was um, that, of course, the human eye is extremely complex. Um, I left with a greater appreciation of just how miraculously everything works over there. What I also found was that it's not the same with everyone. You know, everyone, uh, even if they have the same um, um, low vision condition, they might have slight differences in the way they see things. Um, and also, there are many tools available for computers, uh, right from the OS level to the browser level. You have multiple tools to zoom and to magnify things. But for the physical world, it's a problem. Um, because a lot of times you have uh, proprietary tools which are really, really expensive, sometimes running into thousands of dollars. Uh, a lot of times they don't even ship to uh, places like India. Uh, and in general, you know, it's not really that achievable to, to get that in mass numbers. Uh, there are many native apps which try to do some kind of magnification, but then they all, all have uh, some kind of limitations as well. One more thing to know about low vision is it's a very generic term, and there are many different conditions within low vision. Like, for example, you have severe myopia, yes. You also have things like glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa, many other things that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more in detail later on. But ultimately, what I found was um, you know, when, it, when it came to making tools or making some solutions to help them, what I found was it, it can be basically categorized into two parts. One was basically to help them see better, to achieve a certain task. Maybe someone doesn't have um, 
maybe someone has a problem seeing in low light, maybe someone has a problem distinguishing colors, you know, so maybe to try to help them over there. And the flip side is helping others understand their condition better. So if you can make something which can simulate that condition so that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's very difficult to describe low vision um, conditions to other people. And even family members, uh, when I was talking to them, they said that, you know, from an academic perspective, I understand what uh, the issue with Masan is, um, but, you know, a picture is better than a thousand words. So if you can somehow get a visual aspect to that, that would be great. So I went back to the drawing board because initially I had some ideas about, you know, how could you do like traditional AR stuff uh, with, uh, uh, with people with disabilities, maybe do some kind of depth tracking and that kind of stuff. Traditionally, ARs work on some kind of tracking. You either have some kind of marker and you do some kind of um, manipulation over there, or you do some kind of facial detection and have some filters like this dog filter over here. But things like this, when I talk to people with actual low vision issues, they said, you know, just let me see better and I'll do all the tracking myself. So in the end, what I said was, okay, let me see how I can actually make them see better. So how do you do this? Um, the Low Vision Task Force, which is one of the task forces which is giving their input for the new WCAG guidelines, they, s they have a very nice overview of low vision. And one of the things that they mention is that the user will change illumination, magnification, viewing angle, distance uh, to the object, color, etc., to improve cl clarity. And this is what we want, improved clarity. Now, if you have something on mobile, then of course you can take it around, you can you know, uh, change the distance from the object and change the angle, so it has to be something mobile-based. But preferably, it should also change the illumination, magnification, and color somehow. Um, so I said, hmm, uh, can the web do that? Let's see. Because the first thing and the most common thing that people with low vision use is a magnifier of some sort. Can you do that with the web? The answer is yes. This is one of the issues, uh, one of the demos. So right now it's zoomed out to the maximum uh, possible thing, but since it's a web app, you can zoom even further. So it provides an even further level of magnification than basically any kind of native app, because generally native apps can just zoom till the maximum optical zoom level of the device. But since this is a web app, you can just pinch and zoom as well. So how can you actually zoom using the web? Um, previously, it wasn't really possible to do this, um, but now you have an API called the Image Capture API, which makes it possible to do this. Um, it, it's basically about capturing images, yes, and it gives you a lot of control. Uh, you have a control over the ISO level, the brightness, the white balance, the zoom, the camera flash, and many other things. So you can take, there are two methods for taking uh, photos. The first is called Take Photo. Uh, and what it does is it gets the maximum amount, the full resolution uh, image that you want. And the second is grab frame, which is basically taking whatever the, whatever the current frame of the video is and just passing it off to Canvas where you can do some kind of post uh, manipulation. But uh, what we're really interested in is zooming. So how do you do this? So you do something like, you know, you call the standard, uh, you know, uh, navigator.media devices.get user media stuff, you get the track, and then they have a method called get capabilities, which gives you the capabilities of this device, which is basically, for example, what's the minimum zoom level and what's the maximum zoom level of this device. So, uh, and then you can also get the, you know, uh, call the get settings method, which basically gives you the state of affairs right now. For example, what's the current zoom level right now? And then, it's as simple as applying a new set of constraints. In this way, you say, just apply constraints, advance, zoom 2.0, done. One more thing that I found when I was talking with people with low vision was uh, it's a particularly um, you know, vexing problem uh, on seeing in low light, or sometimes called night blindness. Um, so if there's anything which can improve that, because a lot of times if you go to a place, you don't have full control over the lighting. So if you can have the mobile phone and it can access the torch, that would be great. And of course, the image capture API also gives you access to the actual torch, so you can do a flash effect or you can do some other kind of effect. Uh, in this case, I'm doing something very simple. I'm just, in, you know, if I have a button, if it's pressed, then I do advanced torch true, that's it. Uh, if you want to set it off, you just do torch false. It's a Boolean, works great. 
but you can also have some other um, applications of this. For example, if you can make an SOS app, which can flash like in Morse code, like SOS. Uh, you know, it'll be great. One more thing that I did was uh, what I call reading mode. Um, so a lot of times, what happens is uh, for people with low vision, reading text uh, is slightly problematic. Uh, especially if it's handwritten, because a lot of times uh, when it comes to handwriting, um, you know, there's a lot of variance even within one word. There are a lot of variables. There's the, the surface of the pen. There's, um, you know, the ink. The ink level in the pen also matters quite a lot. So, um, you know, uh, it, it really is something which is of a problem. And what I've done is basically something like this. So. If you if you turn on that mode, well, let's see if it works. Yeah, if you turn on that mode, then you can see something like this, which is slightly more clear than this. And the way you do this, um, there are multiple approaches to this. First, I thought that okay, maybe you can just you know loop through the pixels in the canvas and change each pixel over there. But then I thought you know there already available filters in Canvas that you can use. And you can actually chain these filters one after the other. So this is what I did. Um, you know, I increased the contrast, I uh, inverted the colors, and then it made it grayscale, which worked perfectly for me. The next thing I did was to make it talk. So uh, this is using the Web Speech API. And the Web Speech API basically has two parts. The first is uh, speech to text. And the other is text-to-speech. I was more interested in the text-to-speech part, which is basically speech synthesis. And this is basically how you do it. You first of all check if it's there. And if it's there, you just get a new speech synthesis utterance object. And then you get the voices in that device. You select the voice. And then you can you know, um, also select the rate, the pitch, the volume, everything. And then you can just make it speak using speech synthesis.speak. So that's that. The next thing that I wanted to explore was uh, color blindness, um, because it's a surprisingly common thing, especially uh, in males. Uh, there's a genetic reason why. I'm not sure why, but it is. Um, so one of the uh, things uh, with uh, red-green color blindness is the fact that, uh, of course, people can't distinguish between those two colors. It sometimes appears brownish. So I said, if, the, if I can make a tool which can uh, somehow make it easier to distinguish between red and green, uh, and that would be really great. So uh, this is a small demo that I made for this. So you can see this is the camera. Then I switch to my app. And over there, this red thing will just pop up in the red corner, in the red box. If something is green, then it will be in the other window. So um, any guesses on oh, what approach did I take for this? Canvas, looping over pixels. It was actually SVG. There's not a single line of canvas over here. It's all SVG. Uh, because what, what I, I initially started with canvas, but about what I found was there was a whole lot of computation happening. Even if I did it you know, using a web worker, it was taking a lot of CPU power. So I said, OK, let me see any alternative approaches. And then I use SVG over there, because it allows the same thing. It allows per-channel mani manipulation of the colors. And you, know, you use something called Effie Color Matrix. And we don't really have that much time to explain that over here. But I'll be sharing these slides. And uh, you know, I'll, be, I'll be sharing some links to some really nice articles about Effie uh, Color Matrix that you can check out. The next class of applications that I wanted to build were simulators. And I used a similar approach to the color sieve thing, in which I used the WebRTC output. And then f on top of it, there's some kind of filter. So for example, I have this color blindness simulator app where you can see, you know, you can select different color blindness conditions. And you can see how, in real time, a person with that particular condition will actually see the world. And this is, this is just basically applying uh, an SVG filter on top of the WebRTC output. The same thing with cataracts. Um, so cataract uh, is cause of half of the blindness in this world uh, and one third of all visual impairment in this world. Um, so people know about what, what cataract is, but if I ask a person, random person, you know, what does a person with cataract actually see? They don't know. Um, but it's very simple. Uh, it's a very hazy uh, vision that they have, basically. 
So it's, it's just like this that you see over here. And you can just use a CSS <coughs> blur filter on top of the, the video output to achieve this effect. The next is something called macular degeneration, or sometimes also called age-related macular de degeneration, because it gets worse with age. Um, and what this does is basically this, it creates like a blind spot in front in, in the central vision. Uh, it, and it's sometimes a little bit difficult to understand uh, what it really means. But if you have you know, a simulation of it, people understand what you mean. And this is very easily achievable using CSS radial gradients. And if you combine it with a CSS blind mode, yeah, you can easily achieve this thing. Same with uh, retinitis pigmentosa. People don't know what it is. It is basically the loss of peripheral vision. So everything around um, your, your uh, eyesight. So, and eventually it gets more, ad more advanced until it becomes like tunnel vision. And sometimes it, even that tunnel vision becomes you know, smaller and smaller until there is no vision. And you can easily achieve this using you know, a combination of CSS filters and masks and uh, CSS uh, blend modes or, or just a filter. But where does the JavaScript over here come in? Um, so the JavaScript comes in when you want to apply it on a, on a VR headset, because right now you can just use a mobile phone and record the, record the camera over here. But if you flip it, I want you know, it to be in stereoscopic mode, just like this. right? So if you play it right now, you can also go into full screen mode, and then you can come back. So what I'm doing over here is basically having two different uh, video tags with, uh, with the same WebRTC output and applying an SVG filter on top of it. Um, but what I want is that uh, you know, this browser address bar should not be there. So you can go into full screen mode for that. So this is the code for going into full screen mode. Now the thing is that uh, you cannot just go into full screen mode just like that. It has to be in response to a user gesture. So you have to say, combine it with, or call it in uh, addition to like a click event or something like this. Once you do that, then what I want is that, you know, um, it should not change orientation because you're moving around your head or you know, uh, you're just moving and looking at things. So it should not switch between portrait mode and landscape mode all the time. So I want that once the person is in full screen, the orientation should be locked. And you can do this using uh, the screen orientation uh, API and more specifically, uh, the orientation lock API, which is basically just screen.orientation.lock. So when you're in full screen, you can just lock it to a particular orientation so that it never goes away. And then when you're out of full screen, you can unlock it. So um, a little bit about disability simulators. It's easy to fall into the thinking that you know exactly what you're going through. Um, so whenever I'm, making a, whenever I'm seeing a person make a simulator for a disability, uh, what I do for my simulators is I ask them to actually do a task uh, like it, something, something as simple as picking up this and putting it somewhere else. Uh, generally speaking, people struggle the first time. And it's very critical that you ask a person to do it two or three or four times. Because if you just do it one time, a lot of times what happens is a person will see, oh, you know, a person who is, who is undergoing, say, um, you know, cataract, oh, it's very difficult for them, right? And they'll just, just, just be pity and nothing else. And the last thing that people with disabilities want is pity. Um, so what you want is for them to do it multiple times, maybe four or five times. The first time, they'll struggle. The second time, they'll struggle. Third time, they'll adjust a little bit. Fourth time, they'll adjust a little bit more. And then they'll realize that, OK, it's not like people with disabilities are like constantly suffering 24-7. They're multi capable people who can actually do stuff and, and actually adapt to different conditions. And this is something very, very important because empathy is not just about putting yourself in other people's shoes. That's just one part of it, right? Um, because, you, because you have to realize not just the problems that other people are going through, but also recognize that they're capable of solving those problems. So it's also about acknowledgment. It's, a, it's about acknowledging that they're adaptable, that they, first of all, exist, that they're adaptable, and they, 
deserve the same kind of opportunities uh, that everyone else does. So yeah, I think I'm uh, out of slides. Thank you. <laughs>